Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our meeting this evening. Just a bit of information sharing at the beginning, and then we're going to be dealing with academic matters. Um, so right from the start, we invited you to launch um, the new platform that we are going to be using to communicate with you. And so I'm going to ask Mr. Philip Robinson to run you through the program as to how we're going to be using this new app. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're just going to kind of give you a, a look at how easy the Humzali app is to use, just to make your lives a little easier and give us a way to communicate with you. So we sent out communication asking you to download the app, and there's been a notice on the, the board asking you to download the app. Uh, we are aware that there's an issue with the Android version of the app, but we do have a file that we can give to you to install the app on your Android device that will work perfectly. So if you're battling on an Android device, don't stress, we have a solution for you. You can come and see us afterwards. So in the meantime, we're just going to use the browser. So if you go to mzali.co.za, the spot like that, mzali.co.za, it'll bring you to the same page that I was on and you'll be able to log in from there. Okay, so we just simply need to sign in. So you click on the sign in uh, little tab. Oh. Then we're gonna search the school. So we're at Westering High School. So you, as you start typing Westering High School, Westering High School comes up as an option below. And you just click that then redirects us and brings us to the login page. You just enter your um, username that you have been given. And then the password that you have been given as well. And it brings you to this page. So while you're getting there, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about Mzali. It's a communication uh, system uh, supported by the Department of Education, but it is privately subsidized. It's a means of one-way communication. So the school is able to communicate with you as a parent, but you are not able to communicate back with the school via the app. If you want to communicate with the school, you need to do so via the normal channels of sending an email to the school or uh, phoning the school or something along those lines. The app is zero rated for MTN and Telcom users. So that means if you use Telcom or MTN for your cell phone contract, then you, it, it does not use your data. Uh, then it's still negotiating with CellC and Vodacom, but that's obviously in their hands, so we leave it with them and wait to see what they can uh, do about that. The app is user-friendly. It's not difficult to use at all. There aren't too many things to scroll through and that type of thing. So you're going to find it quite easy to use. Each child has different login details. The uh, username is the ID number, and then you all have a unique password. So the information that you have is for you and you alone. Nobody else can see what you have, and you cannot see what, uh, the information that is being sent to anyone else either. It complies with the Poppy Act, so your information is not shared with anyone because there is some of your private details here. So you, your information will not be shared with third parties, so you won't be receiving random phone calls about products and all types of other nonsense that we don't want to hear about. So what benefits are there for us as a school and you as a parent? For us as a school, the app comes at no cost. It is totally free to the school, which is a great relief for us. As a parent, as we've already mentioned, it's zero rated for MTN and telecom users. And also it gives you immediate access to your child's information. You were all handed that page as you came in, and at the bottom there's a reply slip. And we ask that you please fill in that reply slip and return it to school by Thursday. That is the end of the week this week. So please do that by Thursday. 
Um, we've already spoken about the uh, installing the Mzali app, so you just download it from the appropriate store, whether it be the App Store for Apple users or the Play Store for Android users. It is also available on the Huawei Store, so you can download it there as well. We've already done the sign-in, so now we get to the app. So you can see your child's name there. If you click on your child's name, it'll provide you with uh, some of your personal details. Then we look on the News tab. Here you can see we've got a little red dot telling us that there's uh, news that has uh, been uploaded. It'll also indicate how many new news events have been uploaded. Um, at the moment, it's zero because we've done this a couple of times. The great things about the news um, the news tab is that the latest information will be found at the top. Previously, we've had to scroll all over the place to try and find stuff, but this is quite simple to use. So you simply click on news, and the latest news will be at the top. So the 7th of April and the 6th of April below it. So you can always uh, be sure that the most uh, relevant information or the most updated information will be at the top. Uh, if you click on subjects, it doesn't do it in the browser, unfortunately, but in the app, it does list the subjects that your child um, takes, and then you'll be able to go into each subject and see what marks they got for the various tasks that they did during the term. So you can keep an eye on how their marks are going. Um, unfortunately, we have to send this information to Mzali. It's not automatically synchronized with our school system. And so we will be sending our data through to Mzali from time to time, and then it will be updated by them. We don't use the textbooks tab because we use ebooks. That was just to record the condition of the books that you have. Then we move on to the attendance tab. Now, this just notifies you or gives you an indication of your child's attendance at school. Um, this is done daily obviously, and it's done first thing in the morning. So you, you should be able to tell by 9 o'clock uh, whether your child is at school or not. So it's all nicely color-coded. If there's a red block, it means that your child is absent on that day. If there is a yellow block, it means that they're late for school. Um, if the block is blue, it means that they left school early that day. And if the block is purple, then they arrived late that day and they left early. And at the top, it gives you a summary. So total days absent says two, for example. Uh, total days late, one. So it just gives you an idea of, of your child's attendance at school. Uh, we're using one of our uh, metric pupils' accounts here today. And so this information that we're showing you is not uh, a reflection of that child. We've just loaded sort of random stuff on just to demonstrate it to you. So here you can scroll between the months, and we've loaded some absenteeism here. So there you can see on Wednesday the 2nd, the child was late for school. On the 10th and the 18th, they were absent from school. On the 16th, they left early, and the 22nd, they were late, and they left early. So the color coordination really makes it easy to make sense of what's going on there. And obviously you can scroll back through all the months of the year so far. And it has been updated uh, for grade nines as well. Then we go on to the schoolwork tab. The schoolwork tab, we're going to be using that as a way of communicating with you as a parent, almost like the SMSs that we, that we send out. We will upload uh, information there. For example, um, a task hasn't been done, homework hasn't been done, or something has been well done. Uh, they've achieved an excellent mark in a task or a test or something like that. So the schoolwork tab is where we're going to be sending uh, communication to you. Um, and we can do this to a class. We can do this to an individual. So not all the information here will be relevant to everyone. We may send you personal messages um, in this tab as well. 
And then the last one is the EduLink, which is just basically a link to various educational uh, resources. Obviously, these are sponsors uh, for the app. So you can go and peruse those as you wish in your own time. And if you just want a quick kind of overview of the Mzali app, you can go to the, the website mzali.co.za. And at the top there, it does say watch video tutorial. And then you can watch a tutorial um, on the Android version or on the iOS version. So if you just want to uh, have a look at that in your own time, you can do that as well. And that is all I have for you this evening. Thank you very much. And I hope that you will find this app useful. All right, thank you, Mr. Robinson. Are there any questions at this stage? How many? Okay, yes, ma'am. Okay. When we break now, at the end of this session, we're going to break, and Mr. Robinson will be available to assist you to um, download the app. As we said, they're busy doing some maintenance currently, and so the Android version is not working. Those of the Android devices, it's not picking up the app. You have to go, to go via another pathway to get there. Okay. The subjects, we can explain to you now. The subjects... Um, is not there yet. We have to send our data down to um, Zali, and they will upload that for us. Okay. Are there any other questions at this stage? Okay. A few questions that has come up over the past few nights are, how many people can load it? You can load it. Your husband can load it. You can, the child can load it. So all the information you can load using that password and username, you can put on a number of devices. So if you want someone to keep tabs on what your child is doing at school, you can have him on the, ta on that, um, on the app and both parents can be there. So you can use more than one device. Okay? Can I just have an indication by show of hands how many people have managed now to download the app and get into the app? Just by show of hands. Okay. Using, did you use the website or did you use the, the, the app website? Who went via the, the website? Most people went through the website. Okay, so we will be available. Mr. Robinson will be available at the, um, as, as we break the session for you to, to download the app. The reason why we have got a reply slip on the, the little sheet that you got when you came in this evening is that you must now give us an indication that you've downloaded the app and that we are ready to communicate with you using this app. That's why the reply slip is there. Okay, so that when we switch over, we know that we are communicating with you. That communication doesn't suddenly now come to a standstill. So currently we're still using emails and SMSs. We're still going to be using that until everybody has the app. The app is fully functional and operational. Then we know that we can use it. We can use that platform. All right, then some parents also asked, it works like WhatsApp. So you'll have it on your, on your screen um, of your phone. You can then... It doesn't pop up and tell you that there's notification. So WhatsApp will tell you with an icon that you've got messages. You'll have to physically go into the app. We have asked them. We hope that by the time they're busy doing maintenance that they'll be able to have that so that if there's a message for you, it will indicate on the app that there's a message for you. However, at this stage, you have to go into the app. And when you're in the app, with the red icon, it will show you if there's a news item or if there's something new, homework, whatever there is, it will be indicated on the app. Okay. All right, does anyone have a question now? Yes, ma'am. You know, Mr. What we're going to do is tomorrow the last group of grade eights come through. Then I will email the link that you can use to get onto the app. Okay, so we'll email that to you, and then you can go directly via the, the, the pathway that we'll, the link we'll send you to get onto the app. Okay, any other questions there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, each child has a unique um, username. So if you've got more than one child at school, you'll have, there'll be a, a profile for each of those kids. Okay, 
you cannot get the information of someone else. You will only access, you only have access to the information of your child. Other parents can't see the information that you are seeing. All right, and then also um, some parents asked, who owns the information once we, your child leaves the school? Because we've got lots of sensitive information here. We've got absenteeism, we've got ID numbers, all of those types of things. The Department of Education owns it. The EMIS office owns it. So you don't have to be fearful that someone else is going to be using information that is sensitive information um, in a way that it should not be used. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, then we're going to move on to um, our second part of the evening. Uh, but before we go there, I'm going to ask Mrs. Um, Paul. She's our student counselor. She's going to address you just about certain aspects that you need to be aware of, especially when it comes to your child's um, progress, when it comes to the higher grades. So I'm going to ask Mrs. Paul to address you right now. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, uh, parents, learners, and my fellow colleagues. I have some notes to guide me, so please bear with me. So I am Mrs. Bull, and I'm the school counselor, a social worker by profession, and I'm here to address you on the concession process. So firstly, a concession is a support tool or an allowance granted by the Department of Education under the branch of support services to assist the learner with a learning barrier, especially during exams. So with the application process, it's normally submitted or completed and submitted within the first term of the year. So it's imperative for me to compile that information throughout the year so that the following year I'm able to submit timelessly. And thereafter, the Department of Education will handle the application and the feedback will then be provided to the parent if that concession is granted or not. Considering that there is a learning barrier, a learning barrier is always caused by a condition, whether it's a chronic or medical condition or a psychological condition that the learner may present with. Because of that, it's important for us to have evidence of that by means of a psychological assessment, so the learner needs to undergo that, and it needs to be not older than two years because I know some parents would perhaps do that in, on a primary school level. So we cannot submit that report. We need one that's recent. And then same with the medical report. The specialist involved to diagnose that learner with the condition also needs to provide a motivational letter or a medical report outlining the condition whether pertaining to the nature or the severity of that. So a learning barrier is anything that would hamper a learner's ability to learn or for them to f perform rather to the best of their ability. When we're looking at types of learning barriers, we're thinking of chronic health conditions such as diabetes, hemophilia, which is excessive muscle bleeding or bleeding of the joints, so that learner would need some rest breaks in between the exam and something like scoliosis. There are many more that can be noted. Also, dyslexia, which is one of the most common learning barriers. That is, learners who have trouble with reading and comprehension. And then dysgraphia, difficulty writing down thoughts or trouble with grammar. Dyscalculia, very big words. Even myself, I have to become acquainted with those. Problems with numbers and mathematical skills. And then there's dyspraxia. Challenges with motor task, including hand-eye coordination, auditory processing disorder, which means the learner has difficulty translating the sounds into coherent thoughts. Visual processing disorder, verbal processing disorder, and then also amongst the most common ADD and ADHD, which I think uh, most people are familiar with. So because of those um, learning barriers, um, it's important for me, or actually I rely on the educators to give me the information of the learner because they know their performance throughout the year and I use that actually to complete the application form. So how you know that maybe your child presents with a learning barrier or possible learning barrier, they may have extreme difficulty or dislike in 
Oh, a delay rather in writing or reading. They have a hard time comprehending and organizing information. They are sloppy, disorganized, schoolwork and disorganization in general, problems with mathematics, issues with remembering or memory or retaining information. This is usually what the psychometrist or psych counseling psychologist would assist the learner on. Trouble paying attention to task at hand and following directions or instructions consistently. So it doesn't always mean that that learner has a learning barrier. It could mean something else. But it's important for us to note that. So how do we know when to intervene? Um, we take note when the parent reports the learning barrier to the school or the grade ed. And also the educator is very trained on, or highly trained on detecting whether a learner presents with a learning barrier. So it's important that as parents you take note of that. And there needs to be a consistent pattern. Also, with regards to the intervention, the steps to take then would be to discuss it with the grade ed, um, inform the grade ed about that if you pick that up, and then also with myself and, of course, also include the child in that. Approach a clinical psychologist or psychometrist if the child has not yet undergone the assessment, and then submit that to us so that we can accompany the report with that. So some of the concessions you can be, grant, or be granted to learners are rest breaks in between, additional time, which is 15 minutes per hour of an exam, or if the learner has a visual impairment, enlarged um, exam papers. So should you have any questions, um, please contact Graded or myself via email or the school. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Paul. Now, um, you would ask yourself, why are we discussing this with you at this stage? Um, application to the Department of Education, especially when we're writing external papers, which is your normally, under normal circumstances, now not COVID, we already started writing external papers in grade nine, in grade 10, grade 11, and 12. Grade 12 are all external papers. Grade nine is normally language and maths. Grade 10, we've got um, physical sciences, accounting, English, grade 11 the same, and then grade 12, all the papers are external papers. Now, an external paper means that we can't do anything to that paper. So if that paper needs to be enlarged, it has to be enlarged, especially when it comes to the grade 12 paper. Once that paper, we only open that question paper in the venue here. We cannot take the paper out of the venue. Okay? So if your child needs a, uh, a question paper where the font needs to be larger, that needs to be applied for timelessly. The department then processes that and sends us a paper in that format for the child to be able to utilize that on the day of the examination. If a, a monitor comes into the venue and we're writing an examination and the learner needs extra time, he's got a special uh, uh, or form that in, um, tells us that that child needs to get extra 15 minutes per hour. If the child doesn't have the documentation, we are not allowed to give that child extra time. So we're saying to parents, the, these avenues are available. Some of our children are not successful at school because we're not picking up the barriers to learning. And we're not picking it up early enough. So if you find that your child, and you know, you've been through the primary school now, you know if your child has a barrier to learning, if he writes very slowly, or if he doesn't hear very well, there are the avenues that can be tapped into to be able to help or assist this child when it comes to writing an examination. But there is extensive paperwork that needs to be completed and excessive reports that needs to be compiled before those concessions are granted. If we apply for a concession now in grade nine, the concession holds all the way up to matric. So utilize those concessions now already. It's going to take a lot of stress off the learners because some of them sit in the exam and they don't get to finish the exam. They know the work, but they don't have the skill to write at the pace at which the other kids are writing. So we're finding that those kids are flunking, they're failing exams because they're not having enough time to, f to complete a question paper. So we're asking you to please take these concessions quite seriously um, so that at the end of the day, they can best utilize the time or the concession granted to them. All right, we're going to move on to the third part of our evening this evening, and that is interaction with um, subject teachers. Now. 
I did send an email home telling you that if a learner got anything in either level one or level two for the subject, or even a level three for English, that we were preparing intervention sessions for your learners. That would take place, takes place every day from 20 past two until three o'clock. It comes at no cost to you. We are doing this so that we can, we, we assisting the learners so that at the end of the year they will be successful. Okay? You would have received, each of them received a hard copy of which intervention takes place on which days, and on the intercom on a daily basis, we do instruct them as to which venues they should be going to. All right? Now, at this stage, we are going to separate the, the crowd a little bit. If you are here this evening and you had an invitation to the meeting, if you had an invitation to the meeting, that means your child, in your child's report, we said you are to attend the meeting this evening. We want to ask you to stay in the hall. We're going to have the various subject um, specialists address you on what went wrong in that subject and how you can assist your child. All right, then, so there we're going to do that. If after that, you still feel that you need to speak to the child's teacher on a one-to-one -one basis, then we're going to grant you that as well. But most times, we're going to say the same thing to all of you for a certain subject, more or less the same thing. So that's what we've asked rather to do um, the subject specialist speak to you as to what went wrong. And I'm actually going to go as far as to say to you that we're going to put this into um, a document format and send it home to you so you can see which the areas are which your learners are battling with and how you can assist them. So there's going to be the assistance with what we're saying to you this evening. We're going to put it into a document for you and we are offering intervention lessons for you. Okay? So, yes, ma'am. All right, we're looking for the following learner in grade 9 or is it Sia Lisa Napulula? Are you here? There, there's the parent there. there. Can you just indicate by show of hand where the parent is? There we go. Okay, so those of you that had invitations to this evening's meeting, you can remain seated. The others... You can visit the subject teachers. They are in, Mrs. Mrs. Alton will show you, they're in F3 and F2. You can go and speak to the subject teachers there. But those who had invitations to this evening's meeting, we request that you stay in the hall right now. Okay, for those who don't have an invitation to the meeting, to especially the academic part that was in the report, there was a reply slip, you can go, if you don't have an invitation, you can go to F3 and F2. We are now looking for the next person here. Yeah, there was a swap with Georgia Mayer in 9R. Georgia Mayer in 9R. Mr. Robinson, can I ask you to go to the entrance for and assist those parents who are downloading the app? Uh, those parents who are leaving the hall right now, if you have uh, need assistance with downloading the app, Mr. Robinson is on his way. All right. The problem areas that we found with the grade nines for this year were English. Now, to pass English at grade nine level, you need at least 50%. And so I'm going to ask Mrs. Anderson, she's the new um, subject head for English, she's going to address us on some of the areas that she finds needs attention in order for your child to be successful at the end of the year. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few things that we can be, um, think about in order to get your child through English at the end of the year. Now, what we need to bear in mind is that English is our home language here at Westring High School, and it is our language of teaching and instruction. And so it is imperative that your child 
um, gets a good grasp of the language, not only to pass the subject English, but also to have a general understanding so that they can understand the other subjects and also communicate better in the other subjects. And so grade nine learners, you need to think about the fact that if you are getting 45% for English, or 35% for English, or even 55% for English, which technically is a pass, you are only really understanding that amount in your other subjects. So if you're getting 41% for English, you are understanding 41% of your maths class, 41% of your history class. And so there will be huge gaps in your um, other subjects and learning as well, because there is a problem in English. And so it is extremely important not only to get the 50% pass mark to pass English and to pass the year, but also to improve in your other subjects. Now, when we look at English as a subject, we look at four components. Every term we are dealing with these same four components, and every year we deal with the same four components. So we have the oral component, the writing component, and then literature and language. Now, in grade nine, although we deal with all four of them every term, it is really the oral component and the language component that create or form the bulk of your child's mark. The oral component, every term we do one oral, which counts 10 marks. And the learners love to say, ma'am, how, how much does this count? It's out of 10. But the oral component can count up to 25% of the mark. So even although the actual task is minimal, because 10 marks, oh, what's 10 marks? But it can be um, a quarter of your child's mark at the end of the term. And what we need to be in mind is that the oral component counts twice. So it counts once for your SBA mark, and then it counts again that same mark as part of your exam mark, because the oral component counts as an exam as well. So if your child is going to do well in an oral, then it counts um, in a good way twice. But if your child is going to be flippant about the oral, they don't prepare, they arrive at class, um, they're gonna wing it, as a lot of them like to say, and then they stand in front of the class and they get stage fright, they start laughing, um, they, know, they haven't really thought about what they're going to say, it counts badly twice. And in grade nine, it is a huge component of the mark. We have also found this year that we have a larger number of learners reluctant to do orals. They don't want to say the orals in front of the bigger class. They're shy. They're not used to communicating. And we can put that down to um, less time in the classroom, less interaction with their peers due to COVID. But really, ladies and gentlemen, your child needs to realize that the, the children that they are saying the oral in front of have been their classmates now for two years. They speak and interact with these children on a daily basis. So just be afraid to stand in front of 30 children or 25 children. Our, our English classes are actually quite small. It really is just an excuse. And your child needs to realize that an oral com, um, task is an exam. Each and every task that they do as an oral, it is an exam. And then, although we do literature and we do do writing, in grade nine, it is a very small component. The other half of the mark is really language. We wrote a very big language test in term one, and we're going to write a very big language test in the exam time now in term two. And that is where the English teachers found the majority of the problems. There are huge gaps in your child's language foundations. Knowledge that they should have learned at primary school is non-existent. And so what we have had to do is we've had to play catch up as well as teach the grade nine syllabus. And what is very concerning for us is that our grade nine, our, our language syllabus form a trick really should be complete by the end of grade nine. Language does not change. A verb in grade nine is the same verb in grade 12. Concord in grade nine is the same in grade 12. And so really we try to complete our language as much as what we can by the end of grade nine.
because when we get to grade 10, 11, and 12, the, flip, the focus of the language um, flips, and writing and literature become the bulk of the mark. And so we then need to focus our time and attention then on the literature component and the writing component, component and we expect our grade nines um, or, or our learners to carry the information that they learned in grade eight and nine across into 10, 11, and 12. Sometimes we never touch on it again, ladies and gentlemen, but it can appear in that grade 12 final exam. And so the grade nines need to step up. They need to step up and realize that what they are learning now is actually part of their matric. They can't play around. They can't use excuses. We obviously can put a lot of the gaps down to the lockdown and the fact that they weren't in the classroom all the time and that there was a, lot, a loss of teaching time. But that cannot be our excuse. And so what we need to do is the three components need to work together. The teachers are in the classroom teaching. The learner has to play their part. They have to listen. They have to do their homework. They have to ask if they are unsure. And parents at home need to also play their part. You need to um, look at the child's homework, assess where there are problems, and contact us. And say, I noticed when my child was doing the summary, they got zero. How can we help? So that we can also do our job better. So what, are, what is the way forward? The way forward is our extra lessons, our intervention program. It runs on a Tuesday. The grade eights and nines have a lesson from quarter past two until three o'clock every Tuesday. Um, for the next six weeks, started today, and then for the next five weeks thereafter, we are focusing on the language exam that they are writing at the end of the term. Every week, we are going to focus on one question, so one type of question. Today, we did the comprehension skills. Next week, we will look at the summary and so on and so forth. So by the time your child is sitting to write that language exam, they are very aware of what could be in that paper, what questions will, will be asked, how they can answer those questions so that they can get the full total of the marks. Um, and what is very nice is because we are only working with our level one, twos, and threes, it's very small classes, and the children are more comfortable to ask. We understand that when you're sitting with a 95% child, you don't want to ask a question because that child's going to think I'm stupid. It's not that, ladies and gentlemen. Your child needs to ask the question so that we can help them to improve. Otherwise, you are going to stagnate. And we are all going to move forward, and you are going to stagnate. So learners, I'm appealing to you to please ask the questions. And I can promise you, if you ask the question, 80% of the class are like, phew, I'm so glad he asked that. I also need to know. Because everybody is unsure. All right, and so our way forward is extra lessons and intervention, um, past papers, and this is where the parents can play a role. If we give a past paper, sit with your child and let your child ask you and help them. Um, don't give them the answers, but help them. Past papers often come with a memo, and so you can see the answer and you can guide your child and then communicate back with us. So grade nines, there's really no excuse. Um, you can approach us. We have um, lots of our senior learners who are also willing, very willing to assist you. You need to just tell us what your need is. But really to sit back and say, oh, well, I don't know. We, we cannot have that attitude. And so we really do need to fill in the gaps that are missing and move forward so that everybody is ready for grade 10 next year. If you have any further questions, you're more than welcome to email me, and then I can direct that email to the relevant teacher. Um, but it, the biggest appeal is for all three of us to work together for the betterment of your child. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Anderson. Now, parents, please take note. English is the one thing that is going to cause your child to fail right through to matric. And if they're not doing well in English now, then you're going to have a problem in grade 10, because grade 10, the one requirement, if you fail English, you fail. Grade 11, if you fail English, you fail. Grade 12, if you fail English, you fail. So English to us is very, very important. And I think learners should really start putting some more into their English at this stage. 
We do, however, for grade 8 and 9, the pass mark for English is 50%. When we get to grade 10, 11, and 12, they drop that to 40%. But it's still one of these subjects, the most important subject for a learner to pass. And as Mam says, the language, the same thing that you taught in grade 8 and 9 is going to carry through to grade 10, 11, and 12. So the importance of getting that English right right at the beginning. The second subject that creates problems for us here in the GET is mathematics, and so I'm going to ask Mrs. Nell to address you on the maths component. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen and learners. Um, I am Mrs. Nell, and I will be addressing you on the junior maths problems that we had in term one. Our way forward and what we can do to help these learners to succeed in mathematics. So can I please ask that we go to the first slide? All right, it's really tiny, um, so I hope we can read. Um, basically, where did we go wrong in term one? What made up our term mark for term one? First of all, we had an assignment which counted 40% towards their term mark. This assignment was sent home and the learners had one week in which to complete this assignment. The problem is that with some of our learners is that they do it at the very last minute. Sometimes even the morning that they need to hand the assignment in, they are busy frantically um, finishing it off before school starts. That is unacceptable. They have one week to do it at home with books. They can ask, come and ask teachers. They can get help to do this. They need to be doing that. We then also had a control test that counted 60% towards their term mark. Again, lack of preparation. So we'll touch on some of the problem areas shortly. This term, what are we going to get? There's an investigation that is counting 40%. The problem now comes in is that the Department of Education has now insisted that all assessments get done in class. So there's no more investigations, projects, assignments, anything like that going home anymore and the learners getting time to do it at home. Everything has to be done in class under test conditions. They will have, when it's an investigation and a project, they will have their tablets there, their books there to assist them. They're just not going to have their peers or their tutors or those types of things. So that is a slight little problem, but it is preparing them for when they get to their senior grades. A lot of assessments are now being done in class to stop the whole, um, we're getting assessments, uh, assignments that are 80% and then the learner's getting 50% and when it gets to grade 12, if that gap is too big, department actually can throw out marks if it is too big. So they are trying to lessen that gap. Um, and then obviously it is the June exam, which will be, um, the timetable will be sent out towards the end of the month. This exam is on term one and term two's work. All right, so it is a large portion of work that needs to be studied and practiced in order to get good marks in that exam. In term three, we have a project. Again, this will have to be done in class, so we will give them sufficient time in which to do it. It's normally a double lesson. 50 marks, one hour. They will do that in class. And then there's also a control test that counts 60% again. When it comes to term four, we talk about a year mark there. Um, that is made up of a CAS or your SBA. So all your assessments from term one, term two, and term three gets pulled into 80% worth of your year mark. This was last year. I'm not sure what department is going to enforce on us this year. In the past, it has always been a 40% CAS and 60% exam mark. However, last year, the exam only counted 20% towards their year mark, which shows you and which means that all your assessments throughout the year are so, so important. So already some of us are sitting on a back step because our term one CAS is not looking that great. We unfortunately didn't make the 40% mark, all right? That means now that you have to work as hard as you've ever worked so that you can start boosting that SBA mark for the end of the year, all right? Again, we're not sure what's gonna happen, what the weighting will be for the exam and your SBA, but like I said last year, it was an 80-20 split. So you have to boost those term marks 
do your assignments properly, learn for your tests. Next slide, please. All right, what are the problem areas that we are finding in maths? The first one is basic understanding. We all know that maths is a building subject. So it starts right from when they were little babies and you were teaching them one, two, three to count on those things. Then they went to grade one and they learned all those basics. Every year we build on that. So somewhere along the line, there might be a gap in their knowledge or a section that they're not um, focusing on or that they battled with, we now need to try and bridge that gap as best as possible. So our basic understanding is one portion of it. The next one is not paying attention in class. That is also, you'll be amazed how many, some of these children cannot keep their eyes open in class because they are so tired. So we please urge you that you try and get your children to get a decent night's sleep and that cell phone sometimes is the worst enemy because you might already be fast asleep but they are sitting on social medias and all sorts of things and not getting enough sleep and they come to school the next day and they cannot, their eyes are rolling back in class. So not paying attention, we have to be fully awake, we have to pay attention in maths because we do a new concept every single day in maths if I lost today's concept, tomorrow I'm going to be even more lost because I build on the previous day's concept. So please make sure, learners, those of you sitting here, you need to be awake, you need to be focused. It's very easy to get distracted in class. You've got to focus, 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 focus. Also, lack of preparation for tests and exams. It amazes me if I stand up and I give my class their marks back and then I say to them, how many of you actually studied for this test? Half of the class, at least half of them, don't raise their hand. And that for me is a major problem. Like it says in, ma in red, maths is an everyday practice subject. In order to do well in maths, I need to practice maths every single day. I can't learn maths. I have to practice maths. I've got to do sum after sum after sum. I've got to build confidence. Now, some of you will tell me, but I hate maths. I can't work with numbers. Most of the time, that comes down to a lack of confidence in that subject. I always say, if I had to go and play a game of rugby this afternoon, Mr. Van Nickerk would probably hate me to be on his field because I have no idea how the rules work in rugby. So I will be the worst player on the field and I will hate every minute of it. But as soon as I start to learn the rules and understand, I'm gonna get confident and I will soon start to enjoy it. That's maths as well. But we've got to get to that confidence level. Notebooks, not up to date. Please, can you do a favor or do us a favor and go and ask, not just in mathematics, ask for your learner's books, do checkups and see what that maths book or that English book, or EMS, whatever the book it is. Have a look and see. Maths, we give notes. Sometimes those notes aren't even completed. Their homework is not done. So check up on them. You have every right to say, bring me your maths book. I want to see what's happening, all right? Um, homework, please don't let your children tell you that they did not get maths homework. They get maths homework almost every day, basically every day. Even on the weekend, they will get maths homework. If they say to you, oh, I didn't have homework today, then say, okay, bring me your book, let's look, at a let's look at an exercise where you didn't do one of those sums and do this for me now. Get them to practice. The more they practice, the better they're going to become in that concept. So you need to remember that we cannot give the learners the whole exercise to complete for homework. So there are exercises or numbers in there in those exercises that they did not do. You can say to them, okay, well, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, for instance, and show me, and then go and show your teacher tomorrow. So get them to practice. Even if they say they don't have, then get them to do some more. Homework is not being marked correctly with corrections. So generally the teacher will read out the answers, sometimes display it for them. The problem is that they just put a cross next to it and they don't write the actual correct answer. That's not gonna help you at all. Because when you go back to study, 
you need to know what the correct answer was. I always say that mistakes are proof that you are trying. You at least tried. So that leads me to the next one or with the homework not being marked or not being done. Sometimes they say, I haven't done my homework because I didn't understand. Try. Try. Attempt it. We're only going to learn from trying. At least I gave it a shot. But to just leave it out, I'm not going to learn anything from that. So if you ask for their homework and you check and you say, but why is C blank? So let's try it. Try it for me. And then tomorrow you can ask your teacher, where did you go wrong? Or you can fix the problem. But to just leave it out is unacceptable. And you need to make sure that you are marking your work correctly. All right, I've already touched on the last one where assessments are being rushed and done at the last minute. That now is also going to be a problem now with our assessments all having to be done in class. But your tests and your projects, everything, you need to just prepare as much as you can. Next one, please. How can you help as the parent? Like we said earlier, check the maths books. If you don't get your daily, at least doing it weekly. Like I said, they're going to get homework. They should have a homework diary. They should be writing their homework down. Check that it is done. Say to them, come and show me your maths homework. If there's just answers there, they probably didn't do their, their homework correctly because maths is a step subject where you've got to show your steps and you're working out. So if you just see answers, you need to ask them, how did you get to that answer? Show me how you got there. Also, ensure that they are attending the intervention classes on a Monday afternoon. So intervention classes started yesterday, and they will be continuing for the rest of the term. Ensure that they are going to those classes. We want to help your children. Also, make sure that they have a designated proper place for doing homework, not on their bed, or not while watching Sieven Delon at night or whatever they watch on TV. They need to be sitting in a controlled environment, sitting at a desk, sitting at the dining room table, and you also please just pop in and check up on them every now and then because we know that they're on tablets with their textbooks and sometimes they get a little bit preoccupied and do other things that they shouldn't be doing. So keep an eye on them and check up on them. Encourage them to ask their teachers if they do not understand. Mrs. Anderson touched on that as well. They need to ask. It's not your responsibility as the parent to try and help them to get there because you did that a long time ago. That's why we are the teachers here, so that we can help them as much as they can, as much as we can. So if they don't understand, please, learners, ask. If you don't want to ask in class, ask the teacher, ma'am, sir, can I please come to you at break time so you can help me with this concept? Also, use resources that have been uploaded onto the tablets. So we push all old papers, we push any assessments that have been done, that goes with the memo, so they can always go back. If they say they have no homework, say, right, yeah, let's go and look at a past class test, let's do that for me, and then you can look at the memo and see. The more they practice, the better they're going to become. Study guides are also important, um, or you can get study guides, so you can go to Pickwick Books in Warmer, uh, P&A, they all have different types of study books, study guides, that always is going to help as well. The more they practice, the better they're going to become. Know their assessment dates. So I know that they're going to send out a term planner um, in the next few days, which will have all their assessment dates for them. That way you can keep track and you say, right, tomorrow you've got a maths class test. Have you learned? Let's look at something. So know and keep them, keep on them so that you know you need to go and study now. Can I please ask the sound crew just to put up that one um, page for us? If you can just scroll to the bottom. All right, if you see there, there's assessment dates. So those are our assessment dates for maths. These will also get pushed to their tablets, so they will have access to all of that. But you can see there that we already have for grade nine, their first of the class test is on Thursday, the 28th of April. So that will be on chapter eight. That is what we are busy with at the moment. Algebra, it's a very big chapter. 
And then we have a formal assessment on the 4th of May, that is the investigation that will be done in class. So those are the important assessment dates. A class test, don't let them tell you I don't need to learn for it, it doesn't count for marks. That should not be any reason. You want to do the best that you can. Study, because then you can know that I have done well in chapter eight. So when it comes to studying for exams, I know that I have got that in bit of information in my head already. Can we go back to the um, slideshow, please? <clears throat> The next one is make sure that you are signing assessments. All assessments are sent home, whether it's a class test, whether it's an investigation, a, um, assignment, a test, all of those should be coming home and you should have signed them. So generally an SMS is also sent home to where the parents to make them aware that something has been sent home and it needs to be signed and look at them because sometimes the children are too scared to show you and they just quickly sign it themselves. So please also Say to them, you wrote a class test on Thursday. Have you got that mark back? Let me see. So generally give the teacher a week and then they should be getting that assessment back. And then also please make sure that your details are correct so that if a teacher is sending out SMSs to you to inform you that your child didn't do their homework or they failed a test, that you are actually getting that SMS and that your child is not getting the SMS. The next one is what are we doing? as maths teachers. We have got obviously the intervention classes that is started on Monday, every Monday afternoon. We have two dedicated teachers doing that, so the classes are quite small. And we will be going back to term one work and making sure we get the basics in those chapters. So that when it comes to term two exam, that already the term one work that was the problem, we can now fix it as best as we can. 40 minutes is not a lot of time. It goes by in a flash of a second. So there needs to be, there'll be extra stuff that they will have at home that they will need to sit and do as well. So you can ask them to show you. It's all on their tablets and there will be a bit where it says, now you try and they can do that in their own time as well. So sit on them, make sure they do these things. Extra maths classes, we also are offering extra maths classes free of charge. So there are two afternoons available for that. Um, sign crew, if you can please put on the Word document again. Two afternoons, they are duplicate sessions, so your child will choose the day that best suits them or if they don't have an intervention class on that day. We have got on a Wednesday from 20 past 2 until 3, it will be in my class, and then on a Thursday with Mrs. Lombard in F2, also from 20 past 2 until 3. These classes will cover term 2 work. So intervention, we're helping you to bridge the gap in what went wrong in term one. Extra maths classes will be for term two more, uh, work to make sure that we are doing the best that we can there. And then also, just in closing, teachers are available at break times. Your child just needs to go to the teacher and say, can I please come and can you assist me? We want your children to succeed just as much as you do. We want to help them as much as we can. So please, learners, get your teachers to help you. If you don't understand something, get your teacher to assist you. We want to see you succeed. We want to see you pass, all right? And just a last little thing for the learners. Study while others are sleeping. Work while others are loafing. Prepare while others are playing. And you will enjoy while others are regretting. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mrs. Snell. As I said, we will put that into a document format and email that to you. Please take note of the importance of maths. We will call you back to a subject choice meeting around about September this year for grade nines. If you want to choose a subject like physical sciences, accounting, or IT, we look at the maths mark. If you don't have a good maths mark, then we don't recommend that you do one of those subjects. So if you are interested in following a career, either in physical sciences, accounting, or IT, that maths mark is going to have to improve quite drastically. All right, another area of concern which has popped up lately, which was never an area of concern, 
now becomes an area of concern is social sciences, and so I'm going to ask Mrs. Barrow to come and address us first about geography. Good evening, ladies and gents and learners. My name is Mrs. Barrow. I am the subject head for social sciences. For some of you that are not aware, social sciences consists of two separate components. The first one is history, and the second one is geography. They have an equal weighting. They are both weighted 50% each to compile to the 100% for social sciences. Many learners in primary school would have been taught social sciences as one subject. But from grade eight, it is separated as two separate subjects. You are taught by different teachers in most cases. And the content is a lot more than it was in primary school level. I'm sure some of the learners can agree with, with that. There's an increase in what they need to know and the amount of work that they need to do. I'm going to specifically be speaking about the geography component. Um, Ms. Hoch will touch on the history in a few minutes. So for term one, for geography, we only had one formal assessment that needed to be done. Therefore, two to three weeks into the term, we decided to do an informal assessment, just a 10 mark test, sorry, to see how the learners were progressing through the work that they were being taught and if they were grasping the concepts correctly because term one for geography is map skills. Many learners battle with this. It's the only term that we do map work or map skills in grade nine. But it is something that is needed if you are a learner that wants to do geography in grade 10, 11, and 12. The informal, assess was done, sorry, the informal assessment was done. Marks were SMS through to parents for learners who did not pass, as well as a letter was sent home. So for those of you who did not pass that first little test, your parents were then notified because it was based on work that was being taught and needed to be understood for the formal assessment that would take place later on in the term. The formal assessment was done towards the end of the term. It was written when most of the tests for the other subjects were written. There was a what to learn that was pushed on two weeks before this test was written. And it was evident for many learners that they simply did not even open the document because a lot of the work that was questioned and that was in the what to learn to go through, the learners had no idea what was going on. They couldn't answer basic questions related to what they needed to learn. Unfortunately, for term one, for map skills, it requires a lot of practice. We do a lot of activities in class. There's a lot of activities to do at home to practice these map skills. Learners actually have map activities that they do in their textbooks. They are required to analyze maps, to look at the data that is given to them. It's a skill of understanding. So my advice, because term one work will be assessed this term again. It is a requirement that for their June exam, they write on term one and term two work. If you battled with these concepts in term one, you need to go and do revision grade nines. There are many, many activities that break down the questions very nicely. All the geography teachers have got extra activities that I'm going to print out and give to our learners who have battled with the geography section this term so that they can practice because that is the skill that is required for geography for term one work. It is practice. For term two, there's a lot of theory that is added as well, which will also be assessed in the exam, but it's basically a 50-50 weighting of term one and term two work. So if you battled in term one and you still don't understand and you are still not practicing, you will then battle in term two again because you are assessed on the same work. Um, if there are any learners who do not understand concepts and that, we are also part of the intervention program. Because geography and history is a split component, it will take place on the Thursday afternoon, but the dates will be provided to your learners, or to your children, should I say, by their teachers, because they are taught by different history and geography teachers. So for instance, the way that we've broken it up, if your child did not fail the geography section, but failed the history section. They will then be required to go to the history extra lessons and vice versa. 
Their teachers will communicate those dates to them on which days the history and the geography will be taking place, but it is definitely a Thursday afternoon as per the letter that was sent home with the intervention dates. So my advice in the way forward for the term one work that was not understood or not practiced correctly is to please go and revise this work and attend the necessary intervention sessions that are available. Because the only way to get through this difficult section that a lot of learners battle with, the map work section, is to practice, practice, and practice. Thank you very much. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Ms. Hoog. I am the coordinator for history for grade eight and grade nine. Um, and what I'd like to say with regards to history is that it, it is not like maths, it is not like geography, there are no formulas, there's no rules that you need to learn. History is not a difficult subject. It is a subject that you just need to make an effort to read and understand. One of the things that I always say to my learners when I start off the year is that history is a story. Just like you read a novel in your languages, it is the story of the world. So it is nothing complicated. There is nothing that you have to practice, practice, practice. It is all about just listening and making sure that you understand the plot of the world. Um, but what we have found when it comes to history is, especially when it comes to grade nines, is that there seems to be this very negative attitude when it comes to history. Because a lot of learners know, okay, I have to get through history for this year, and then I can drop it. So they don't actually care about the subject. We land up ha having where learners the night before are scrambling to understand certain concepts. And you can't do that in history. It's a, it's a very, very long novel to understand. So it is very important for learners to make sure that they are listening in class. We provide PowerPoints to the learners, PowerPoints that come directly from the textbook. They are summaries of the textbook. So learners are asked in class to write down these notes and pay attention to how the teacher is explaining the story. So there's nothing complicated about history and there's no reason why learners should be failing history. What we also find is that Learners don't take these notes down. As Mrs. Nell has um, mentioned, they fall asleep. And notes are not written down. Their books are incomplete. And one of the, the requests that I have as a history teacher is I ask you, please, parents, I need you to check up on your learners' history books. They should have a separate geography and a separate history book. As Mrs. Barrow has said, there are two separate subjects in high school. In term one, we had a slideshow presentation of 58 slides that learners should have taken down. So we cannot have learners who are sitting with books with only five pages complete. So please, it is very, very important, once a week, go and check, where's your history book? Let me see what you've done this week. Also, what is very important when understanding where learners have gone wrong in terms of history for this last term is there is a big jump between history in primary school and history now in high school. One of those components is that history now in high school includes an essay. And that essay, specifically now for the June exam coming up, is 20 marks out of the 75 marks. So it is a big portion of a test and an exam. Now that essay follows a specific structure. It is not like an English essay. There is a specific structure that needs to be understood. And it is very important that learners learn the structure. The structure was taught to learners about two weeks before the test series last term, and it is something that we will be going over in our intervention plan as well. So please make sure that your learners have written down the notes for a history essay, it should be somewhere in their books. Get them to show you. One other thing that I would like to mention when it comes to history and where learners are going wrong is that we give learners key terms and definitions. This is something that they need to learn and understand in order to um, correctly 
answer questions in a test and an exam. So we don't mark verbatim. So we don't ask you to learn a definition and write it out word for word. We mark the idea. Do you have the idea of the concept? We don't need learners to learn 50 definitions off by heart. That's unrealistic. But do they understand the basic concept in their own words? So they do get definitions that they need to write out. They should already have their definitions for this term. Um, so it is very important that that is something that they need to know and understand. Just like geography, um, in term one, history did have an informal test. It was a quick 10 mark test, and that was to give an indication to the learner as to where they are in terms of their general understanding of the topic. This also, like geography, set them up and followed a very similar structure to what they would have done in the test series. This term, there is no informal test, they just have their exam. That exam with geography will land up being their term mark. So it is very, very important that they make the effort in class. There is absolutely no reason for learners to fail history. So please, I ask um, learners, you need to pay attention in class. If you just listen to your teachers, you will have a general understanding of what is going on. And then those PowerPoint slides, if you don't get to copy them down completely, they are taken directly from the textbook. So if you do not finish the slide for that day, you can go home, open up that textbook, and see exactly where your teacher left off. These slides are made available to the learners before the test and exams. But one of the things that we do like to hold off on is that we don't want to give them the PowerPoints right in the beginning of the term. And the reason for that is that they sit there and think, okay, well, the, the notes are on my tablet. I don't have to write anything down. And then they will never open that note ever again. So we try in the beginning to make learners write down these notes. And then about two weeks before the exams, we will then push those notes to the um, tablets so that they will be able to revise if they missed anything out. But really, an effort just needs to be made from the learners to listen, read. History is about reading. That is all that you need to do. It's nothing fancy, nothing complicated. So if we can make an effort all together, learners, parents, and teachers as well, you will be able to pass history. Thank you, ma'am. We're drawing to a close now. I'm going to just read a note which comes from the NS teacher for NS Physical Sciences and NS Life Sciences. Some of the reasons why learners are failing NS, and we had, I think, 93 of them fail NS out of 200 of them. Here are the reasons. Learners are not paying attention in class. They're not focused. They're not dedicated. Learners are lazy because life sciences requires memory. You've got to memorize things. Not revising and memorizing work um, of the day. Not marking homework. And as I said, this memorization. And we think the memorization thing has got to do with the cell phone. Because they have the ability to look things up, they think that they don't have to memorize things anymore. And so we're asking, the life sciences teachers are asking for them to memorize. The physical science teacher says that learners have a very poor work ethic, especially coming out of COVID. Some of them still think that they are in, we are still in COVID, but we've been back at school since last year, March, full time. So they must stop this playful attitude and do their work every day. Paying attention and memorization. I'm going to ask Mr. Van Dekker, he is the graded for grade nines, just to close off the evening for us. Thank you. Good evening, parents, learners, and staff. I just got a few things that I just want to talk to you about this evening. The first one is just general conduct. Ladies and gents, you need to be able to see from your learner or from notifications from the school if your learner is doing homework or not. If you are getting SMSs regarding homework, you know that that learner is not doing their, their part for school. 
We've also got the homework card, so if you get notification that the homework card is filled, that means that for five times your child has not done homework. There's people in grade nine that's sitting on their fourth or fifth homework card, which is totally unacceptable and just shows us that he is not doing his part or she is not doing um, her part. So please check up on your child's homework card and discipline card. Please make sure that your child comes to school dressed and appearance is correct. Because it starts with being positive. If you look positive and you look the part, it's, it just flows over to everything. <laughs> the next thing I want to just speak about, we need to make sure that the kids got their devices. That's the first thing. And that it's fully charged before they come to school. There's how many times when you ask a child, quickly take out your advice, do this exercise, but so it's flat. How can you learn from a, from a book that is not there? It is impossible. So we need to make sure that these devices are at hand at all times during the day. I'll get back to devices, more things about devices later on that I just want to mention as well. Then number three is time management. A lot of our kids spend so much time sitting here at the front of the school doing nothing, waiting for parents. Ladies and gents, we've got tutoring classes. We've now got the intervention. There's so many opportunities for these kids. We've got sport. We've got sport back. After two years of no sport, the kids can finally run on the field. Let's give them opportunity. They just need to manage their time. Because a balanced learner has got so much more um, opportunity to succeed than just someone that goes home and sits and plays with their device and then tries and study for half an hour. And again, this links with my point that I want to speak about is attitude. Your attitude towards school determines how, what you are going to do in school. The example that I love using is driving. A lot of people don't like driving, so they just take the taxi, for example. If you tell yourself, you, I can't drive, you're probably never going to drive. Okay. But if you go out and your first time you drive, you're going to find out, but I'm really bad at this. And the more and more you practice this, the better and better you come. And later on, you're driving to a friend's house, and you can't even remember how you got there. And that is how life and things are. The more you do it, the better you're going to be in it. And your attitude needs to become positive. Otherwise, it's going to be an issue. Then study methods. Ladies and gents, summaries need to be done weekly. You need to make sure by the time that we get to exams or a big test that there's not still time sitting and doing summaries. Because that's wasting time. What you should be doing before you get to a test or exam is working through papers. You cannot sit with summaries. Then, if you don't understand a question in the paper, you go back to your summaries, not to the book. Because then you have to page through a whole book to look for one example. You, the next point, you need to know your, work, your weaknesses and wor work to make them a strength. If you're not going to work on your weaknesses, it's going to stay a weakness. And exactly the same, connecting it with the driving. If your weakness is driving, the only way that you're going to get it better is by driving school, practice, and getting things better. And then try different study techniques. If you've done summaries that is just written in words, try some abbreviations, for example. Try pictures. Try different study techniques. And there's so many of different techniques online that they can um, study from. And we do the Elevate program with them that helps them with study techniques as well. Assessment dates. Assessment dates is uploaded and sent to parents. Ladies and gents, this um, document needs to be printed and needs to be visible every day of the week. Because you need to be able to come home, open the fridge, and tell your kid, have you studied for this and this and this? And then if they say yes, then say, let's quickly just look at the old paper and let's see how it goes. Yes, unfortunately, having a child is extra work and it's extra effort. But we've made that decision, and we unfortunately need to assist our kids for their better future. <laughs> so please, ladies and gentlemen, Find the document that is sent to you about the assessment dates and follow up. Highlight on that what assessments is done and what dates. And follow up. Is the summaries for that done? Have you done enough papers for that, for that assessment? 
getting back to devices. Ladies and gents, I cannot tell you how many times you sit in a class and a child is on their cell phone. We need to limit these kids with their cell phone usage. A child that is 15, 16 years old has no place. There's no reason for them to be on TikTok or Instagram. It doesn't make the education better. Because what happens at night, TikTok and Instagram is addictive. So what they do at night, they lie back and they start scrolling through videos. And when you look again, it's three hours later. There's a nice video on Netflix that shows the whole thing about addiction to social media. And can I tell you, anxiety, depression, majority of those things come from their social media usage. Get that away from your child. Please remember, you are your child's parent and not friend when it comes to social media. You are allowed to look what they are doing. Take the phone, because you will be shocked on the things that some of the kids are sharing. So please, I urge you, keep tabs on your child's social media usage. There is apps that you can download that tells you exactly how much time your child has spent on each social media app. And if you want to limit them, you can even create a password that if they spend more, more than a half an hour a day on it, it blocks it. You need to do things like that. Unfortunately, they are still children. They, are, they don't understand the consequences of sitting on their phone the whole day. And that can flow over into the academic problems. <laughs> like previous PE teachers said, we've started our intervention classes. Learners need to make sure that they've got this program. And if they're unsure, go to the teacher and ask, what days do I need to attend? These classes is extra. We, we as teachers felt that we need to do extra, and we're going out of our way. We're now asking you, as the learner and the, and the parent, make sure those kids come to lessons. We want to help, like ma'am said. <clears throat> Please note that even if your child is doing sport, he will not be disadvantaged. Sport, if on those intervention days, will then only start at three for that learner. So the team might start practice at 2.30, but that child is excused up until 3 for intervention days. And the coach can't do anything about it because it's a, that's the, the agreed arrangement that we've got with the head of academics in Mr. Haywood. Then we also need to make sure that, ladies and gents, you'll get a lot of SMSs saying, please sign failure letters. This document is not to try and humiliate the kid. It's definitely not the, the reason. The reason why we're sending a failure letter is to notify the parent, and we've got proof that you've noted, noted that this child has failed the test. And then from there, we need to make a plan together to see how we can assist the kid. Please don't see it as a tool that we can... We're trying to bring kids down. It's the last thing that we want to do. We are here to build them up to be successful later on. Just a lot of the, the teachers spoke today, and uh, they, didn't, they mentioned some of the passing requirements. The main passing requirement, like Mrs. Anderson said, is passing English, because that stays the same from grade 8 till matric. You have to have 50% for English. Grade 8 and 9... You have to have 40% for maths. And ladies and gents, we need to motivate our kids. I'm a maths teacher. We need to motivate kids to try and stick to maths. Because I tell my kids all the time, yes, maths lit might be the easier option. But nothing in life worth having is easy. And having maths on your, your matric certificate is going to open way more doors for you than having maths lit. So we need to make sure that we start them young and get them prepared for when they go to grade 10 and 11 and 12, because it's not easy. But with time management, they can do it. <coughs> for those of you that are doing subjects and failing subjects that you don't like, see it this way. This is the last year that you are doing them. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. 
Because like ma'am said, in September, we're going to do subject choices. And then next year, you don't have to see that subject ever in your life again. So please be positive. One year is what you've got with those subjects you don't like. So push it through and make those weaknesses a strength. Because maybe at the end of the year, that might be a subject that you want to take then. And then take it further and it opens more doors for you. Ladies and gents, what I just want to bring to your attention as well, last year's end of year report, a lot of the, the ratios of mark allocations for, for the final report was changed like maths was 80-20. Please note that that might not be the case. And a child's final exam will always, or majority of the time, except for COVID times, count more. Because the final exam is the biggest assessment of the year. So please prepare your child in that, uh, for that. End of year exams will be the whole year's work. If summaries aren't done, your child will struggle. And again, things like anxiety, depression, those are, those are the kind of things that can creep in, especially when kids are overwhelmed. Okay. My final thing, thank you very much for coming tonight. It shows that you are willing to work with us and looking for a way forward to better your child. We really, really appreciate it. I'm going to ask Mrs. Nell just to stand at the back and then just sign, so you can just sign another register as you walk out. But thank you very much for coming, and have a lovely evening. You do still have an opportunity if you want to speak to the subject teachers. They are in room F3 and F2 now. If this wasn't sufficient for you, you still might need to make contact. They are there. And then please take note, parents, we want to say to you, even though we have 99 failures in grade 9, in grade 10, we only have 22 failures. In grade 11, we only had seven failures. In grade 12, we only had four failures. So we are successful. We do put in everything so that we make your kids successful at the end. Thank you for coming this evening, and do enjoy your, the rest of your evening. Thank you.